So, saw the new Batman film. It's fine. Okay, okay, I know that sounds worse than I meant it to, so I'll backtrack. The new Batman film is... mostly good? Yeah, that doesn't sound any better. So how's about I just make a start on this review? So, where to begin? Uh, might as well start with the titular character. This is a very different version of Batman to ones that we are used to seeing on the big screen. Every actor who's approached this role up until now have had their various pros and cons, some more than others. Adam West had a goofy charm to his take that we can all love, even if it's not really the Batman that we're used to seeing nowadays. Keaton pretty much set the stage for every Batman to come after him, and is still one of my personal favourites. Val Kilmer, I would argue, gives one of the best portrayals of Bruce Wayne on screen, less so his version of Batman, but I still give him credit for the fact that his version of the billionaire playboy slash Wayne Enterprises CEO isn't far off the mark from the comics. George Clooney? No. Just all of the no. Christian Bale I think does fine enough, his Bruce Wayne is decent and he looks menacing in the bat suit, it's just that when he starts talking I can't remotely take him seriously. You all know exactly what I mean, don't kid yourselves. So that's what that feels like. I never give it to an ordinary citizen. I'm not wearing hockey pants. Ben Affleck surprised everyone by putting in a pretty solid performance in an otherwise shoddy Man of Steel sequel and managed to follow it up again with the Zack Snyder Justice League. This Batman though is on a wholly different plane of existence to his predecessors. We are as far from the Adam West Batman now in 2022 than I think we are ever going to be. This Batman is dark, he's grim, he pretty much never smiles throughout the whole film, yet given the nature of the story it does make sense, at least for this new take on the Dark Dark Knight. They've essentially taken the grimmest elements of Batman from the comics and turned them up to 11, which while that does lead to some mixed results in my opinion, it still makes for an incredibly interesting take on a popular comic character. We've seen the brooding vigilante a hundred times before, but we've not seen him taken to this extreme a level, and I'm well open to that. If you're gonna do a new Batman film, go wild with it, do your own thing, don't try to wholesale copy those who came before, make the character your own creation, and for the most part, Pattinson and Reeves very much accomplished that. Like I said, for the most part, but I'll get into that later. Bizarrely enough, where this movie really shines for me is less in our hero and more in the supporting characters around him. Zoe Kravitz has instantly become my favourite depiction of Catwoman in any adaptation ever. Anne Hathaway did fine in The Dark Knight Rises, but was kind of forgettable in my opinion. Michelle Pfeiffer gave a wonderfully warped performance as Selina Kyle in Batman Returns, even if she wasn't the most accurate to the comics. This version though is Catwoman fully realised. She's got everything, the sass, the confidence, the sneakiness, the acrobatics, the tough self-serving veneer hiding a heart of gold. She's got it all, and Zoe Kravitz acts her way out of the park here. While I object to her and Batman getting together this quick in the movie, especially since, you know, she just lost her roommate who she was implied to be stooping on the side, and now a day later she's giving Batman tongue, that's kind of dicey. She's still a wonderful iteration of Catwoman, and I would honestly kill to see her get her own movie, especially after, you know, that abomination. Colin Farrell as the Penguin was a real surprise. I mean, nothing against the guy, he's an amazing actor, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who saw that casting and went, huh? But yeah, he's incredible as well. Just like Kravitz's Catwoman, he captures everything about the comic character whilst injecting this cool New Yorker-style mobster element to him. He's equal parts funny and intimidating, just like the Penguin in the comics, and again, I'd love to see him appear in some sequels. Hell, the ending all but spells out for us that that's gonna happen, so yeah, more Colin Farrell as the Penguin, please. I also really like the take that they did with this version of the Riddler. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't miss the Jim Carrey spandex and his goofiness, or the bright green suit from the animated series, and like pretty much every Batman media post-2011, I felt like some of the ideas surrounding Riddler was handled a bit better in the Arkham games, like the Jigsaw-esque death traps, but all that being said, this still felt like a good update for the 2020s. You can tell they brought in a lot of inspirations at the writing table, the Zodiac Killer, domestic terrorism, online cults and conspiracy groups. They do a really good job of fusing these 
wildly disparate elements together into a wholly new version of the character. Even when the mask was off and you see Paul Dano in all of his Weasley high-pitched glory, it does weirdly work. He's such a broken, deluded, pitiful human being, you're equal parts disgusted and terrified by him. He kind of reminds me of Gollum in a lot of ways. He's so infuriatingly bad, so frustrating, but you also just want to get this guy some help. I also love the detective element to this film. This is the first Batman movie I can think of where the Dark Knight's investigative skills take front and centre. Not his fighting abilities, not his martial arts, not his ability to pound criminals in the face, but his powers as a detective. This feels very much like a grim, old-school, neo-noir film, and that tone lends itself perfectly to the Batman. And Matt Reeves clearly knows how to lean into that style and make it work, at least until the actual investigations starts going on for way too long and ends up meandering all over the place, but we'll get into that in a minute. And I've got to talk about the cinematography. This is a stunning movie to look at. There were some shots in here where my jaw was on the floor. It's so beautiful, and it manages to do that while not using a ton of colour. It being a neo-noir, very little of this film takes place in the daytime, which means that when there are daytime scenes, usually at dawn or dusk, very appropriate given that this is the Batman, the sunlight absolutely pops out of the screen. But even before then, scenes that take place in absolute darkness still manage to somehow look gorgeous. The film the film's aesthetic kind of reminds me of Sin City meets Blade Runner, the neon signs popping out of the screen, the silhouettes of characters against bright backdrops while still being bathed in darkness. There's this one fight scene, you'll have seen it in the trailers, where Batman is just wiping out bad guys in this corridor, and the only illumination we get is from gunfire from the baddies. So you end up with this Weeping Angel style fight scene, except it's Batman that's coming for you. That's just brilliantly terrifying. Not to mention an incredible car chase with the Penguin featuring the best Batmobile since Batman Returns. Oh, just everything about the way this film looks is perfection. It's exactly the kind of style that works for Batman. Gotham feels like a grungy, unpleasant gothic hellhole exactly the way it is in the comics. So, with all of that groundwork out of the way, all of that praise, all of those great things that this film accomplishes, why don't I think it's as good as everyone is hyping it up to be? First off, I need to address the Robert Pattinson-shaped elephant in the room. How does he do as Batman? Honestly, kind of phenomenal. He's the first live-action Batman that I've seen since Keaton, who does a really good job of emoting and performing through the Batman outfit. You could just see in his eyes and hear in his voice exactly what he's going through at any given time, whilst also managing to come off as really intimidating when he needs to be. I mean, that scene of him getting out of the Batmobile after the chase and coming towards Penguin, ugh, that sends chills up my spine just thinking about it. So Robert Pattinson as Batman? Brilliant. Robert Pattinson as Bruce Wayne, though... Eh. Look, I'm not gonna knock him too much. This is a difficult role to play at the best of times. You're essentially playing two or three people in one. Bruce Wayne, the public-facing billionaire. Bruce Wayne, the secret vigilante, working in the shadows with Alfred, Robin, and God knows who else. And the Batman. The problem with Pattinson's Bruce Wayne, though, is that there doesn't seem to be much of a line drawn between him and his Batman persona. He's broody and tortured with the cowl on, and broody and tortured with the cowl off. There's no attempt to put up some kind of jovial or eccentric facade when he's out in public, the way I'd argue a billionaire trying to keep his nighttime hobby of beating up criminals a secret would want to do. Nor does he seem less grim and intense when he's hanging around with Alfred in the Wayne Manor or the Batcave. He seems like Batman in every single scene, including scenes where we should be seeing the man under the mask, which just ends up stretching my suspension of disbelief in a movie trying this hard to make Batman as grim and realistic as possible. Everyone in Gotham would just be like, hmm, the masked vigilante who spends his nights beating up criminals with incredibly advanced technology? Could it possibly be the reclusive young billionaire who no one sees in public and whenever they do 
see him, he's always brooding, frowning, and look like he belongs on the cover of a death metal magazine? I wonder! Where this really ends up hurting the movie, though, is in scenes between Bruce and Alfred. In any iteration of Batman, Alfred Pennyworth always serves the role of Bruce Wayne's closest confidant, not just in terms of helping his crusade, but in keeping him stable, keeping him grounded. Alfred is the closest, most loving, most loyal, and supportive person in Bruce Wayne's life, even more so than any of the Robins, Batgirls, Batwomen, or Batwings who have come in and out of Bruce's life. Alfred is Bruce Wayne's bedrock, and in any live-action version of Batman, even the worst ones, I felt that connection, that camaraderie, except for this one. They try their best, and Andy Serkis gives a stellar performance for the few scenes he has, but I just didn't feel like these two had as strong a partnership as in earlier iterations, and I think the reason for that is because this Bruce Wayne just does not feel fully rounded, fully realised, because he is all grimdark, all of the time, and never anything different. There's maybe one scene of real closeness between the two of them when they're talking in the hospital, but even that gets a bit bogged down with all of the plot dumping and exposition that Alfred is shoveling at the screen. And believe me, I'm going to be coming to that in a minute. Now, that's not to say that this is a bad Batman. Far from it. As I said earlier, Pattinson gives a really interesting take on the character. But unless you can balance out that grim, brooding ball of anger and misery with someone a little little more human when the mask comes off, he's only going to feel like half a person. I just didn't feel all of the layers and dimensions that I know that this character has to offer, and that's a real detractor in a movie that's literally named after him. Also, while we're on a tear, what the hell was up with that squirrel suit flight scene? Like, come on, I know you're trying to make this character more realistic and shit, but that's just plain silly. Just let him have the frickin' wings for god's sake. I'd believe that way easier than I would believe the frickin' squirrel suit that Pattinson Batman puts on. This is actually a symptom of another larger problem with this version, and to his credit, I don't think it's Pattinson's fault. So many elements of the movie, the best elements, I would argue, feel ripped right from the comics which inspired them. Colin Farrell's Penguin? Perfect. Same with Zoe Kravitz's Catwoman, or Paul Dano's Riddler. All of these elements feel like near-perfect representations of the comic characters, except for Batman himself. It feels like Matt Reeves or someone from the DC Warner Brothers higher-ups made the conscious effort to make Pattinson's Batman as grounded and realistic as possible. Kind of like if there was a billionaire in real life who decided to go out and do all this stuff, this is kind of what it would look like. And that was probably due to the success of Nolan's gritty, realistic take on Batman, and the studio or Reeves just wanted to recapture that flair. And in fairness, I get that impulse, but what that means is that Reeves tried to make Batman as gritty and realistic as possible, right down to the quote, realistic way for him to fly around the city like a squirrel, but allowed the rest of the cast to retain their original comic book style and characterization. And these two things end up clashing in the movie. For comparison's sake, in Nolan's Batman trilogy, the tone wasn't so jarring because everything surrounding Batman shared that realistic tone. Joker, Ra's al Ghul, Bane, Jim Gordon, they all felt like realistic versions of the characters and not wholly accurate representations from the comics, and that isn't the case here. You have gritty realism on one side rubbing up against authenticity to the comics on the other. That's conflicting tones right there. You can't just cherry pick which bits from the comics you want to make realistic and which bits you want to keep accurate because those two things do not go together. You have to just choose one and commit. However, I would argue that the biggest problem with this film isn't the inconsistent tone or Robert Pattinson's take on the Batman, but the length and the overly stuffed plot. This movie is near as makes no difference three hours long and my God, it felt like it. I've been seeing a lot of people claiming that the Batman takes perfect advantage of its runtime, talking about how well-paced the movie is and how they never felt bored the whole way through, and I'm just sitting over here going, 
What the fuck are you talking about? I got so bored in this film, which is a real shame and really confusing considering everything that the movie managed to get right. And I think the reason for that wasn't necessarily the runtime, though that definitely played a role, it was the sheer amount of plot that the filmmakers decided to shove in here. First we're dealing with the Riddler killing folks, then we jump over to Selena Kyle and her roommate slash friends with benefits, Anika, trying to get away from Falcone, and then we're dealing with the Penguin and a ton of corrupt officials, and then we're back over to the Riddler, and then we've got a whole conspiracy thing going involving Thomas Wayne trying to cover up Martha Wayne's psych problems for the sake of his political career, and then having this journalist killed, but not actually wanting him killed and just wanting him intimidated, which leads to a whole back and forth over who actually wanted the Waynes killed back in the day, whether or not it was planned, whether or not it was an assassination, or because it was part of this whole conspiracy thing, and, uh, oh my god. Simply put, there's too much going on here. It's a real slog trying to keep up with all of the plot dumps that the characters are throwing at you, particularly around the middle mark where we're getting into the whole Thomas Wayne conspiracy thing. Now on the surface, I actually do like elements of that plot point. The reveal that this foundation Thomas Wayne set up to help the city inadvertently ended up being this bottomless money pit for all of Gotham's scummiest criminals and corrupt officials. That shit's great! What a brilliant subversion and a fantastic reveal. Had they stopped it there, it would have been fine, but instead they had to draw it out and make it more and more convoluted with Martha Wayne in a psych ward and Thomas Wayne wanting to be mayor and then trying to silence this reporter by using Falcone to intimidate and kill him and all that, and it just gets so far up its own ass that the reveal's effectiveness ends up falling flat. That speaks for a huge chunk of this movie's plot. Great ideas are set up, but then over-explained to the point of meaninglessness. Or there are too many plot points and characters thrown into the mix that it becomes hard to keep track of who's who, or what's what, or who wants what. This is the problem with overstuffing your movie with plot and characters. None of them really get the chance to shine, and if they do, they're only shining as much as they can and not as much as they should. You almost forget that the Riddler is even here for a huge chunk of the runtime because the movie dedicates so much of itself to Batman's side quests that you just don't care all that much. Personally, I feel like this movie would have been better served by cutting the whole Falcone Moroni subplot slash backstory out of the whole thing. Just make the Penguin the secret mobster that all of the corrupt officials answer to. That way the plot is more concise and the runtime won't feel so laborious. You won't be inundated with quite as much exposition, there's fewer characters to keep track of, and we have ourselves a well-established Batman villain that everybody recognizes as our secondary baddie. A lot of this film feels a little indulgent, like it's trying to justify its own existence by making the plot as complicated and intertwined as possible, when keeping it simple would have served that purpose a lot better. And this isn't even touching onto the really dumb plot points that the script ends up creating. Batman is apparently a super smart detective who can figure out these riddles in seconds and investigate serial killers with incredible efficiency, but doesn't know not to stand too close to a bomb around a guy's neck when it is seconds away way from going off. When the Gotham police cart an unconscious Batman back to their station, not one of them gets the idea to rip his mask off in that time before he wakes up while he is unconscious. Then after Batman punches a police officer in the station and flees the building, they issue out a warrant for his arrest, but then when the Riddler starts acting up again and shoots Falcone later on, all of a sudden that warrant gets completely forgotten about and Batman is allowed to patrol crime scenes again, like nothing happened. It's like this movie has moments of brilliance interspersed with moments of truly idiotic writing. I know I'm in the minority on this, I know this video is probably not going to get that many favourable comments considering the general consensus the internet has around it. To be clear, I like this movie, I would even go so far as to say that I loved huge parts of it, but I would hesitate to say that I loved the whole thing, and I definitely don't think that it holds a candle to something like The Dark Knight. I love Zoe Kravitz, I love Colin Farrell, I love Paul Dano, I love Jeffrey Wright as Jim Gordon. The cinematography is outstanding, and when the writing is on point, it is 
on point. But the plot is too convoluted and the film did not in any way justify its absurdly long runtime for me. And while Pattinson's take on Batman was great, his version of Bruce Wayne left a lot to be desired. And you kinda need both if you're going to be successful in delivering a really satisfying performance with this character. The film is far from perfect, but it's still a worthwhile attempt to breathe some life back into this character, especially considering the current scattered state of DC and Warner Brothers and the DCEU. So despite its flaws, I am glad I saw it and I'm happy to see where this franchise starter takes us into the future.